My name is Elliot Katz, and I'm at the law firm of DLA Piper. I'm an attorney in our connected and self-driving car practice, where I focus on privacy, policy, and regulatory issues surrounding these types of vehicles. And I am very excited to be here today speaking with our esteemed panelists, who I will introduce now. First, we have Emily Frascaroli. Emily is an attorney at Ford, where she advises globally on various automotive issues, including autonomous vehicles. She also teaches a class at the University of Michigan Law School on legal issues surrounding autonomous vehicles. Eden Adams, next to Emily, is a senior fellow at the R Street Institute, a think tank whose mission is to engage in policy research and outreach to promote free markets in limited, effective government. At the R Street Institute, Ian oversees matters related to next generation transportation. Next to Ian, we have Stephen Sheffy, who is an attorney in the public policy development area of Allstate Insurance Company's Government and Industrial Regulation Division where he has worked extensively on matters pertaining to AVs. And finally, last but not least, we have Peter Leroux Munoz, who is the Vice President of Technology and Innovation Policy at the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, where he heads the leadership group's federal and state efforts on technology issues, including AVs. So before we dive into the questions, I think Part of my role here is to kind of set the table. Of course, we're up here talking about autonomous vehicles. Why is this important? And, and I would say, why is this conversation and other conversations like this really, really important? And I only have about two minutes to do this, but I think I can pull it off with just a couple of numbers. Um, the biggest issue here to me and many others in the space is safety. Our, our current reality, in in, throughout the world is that 1.2 million people are dying every year due to traffic accidents. In the US, 94% of those accidents are due to driver error. So to put that 1.2 million number into perspective, that would be the equivalent of eight 747 airplanes uh, falling from the sky every day in a given year and killing everyone on board. So imagine if that happened just in the United States for, let's say, a week or even just a few days. We would probably shut down aviation as we know it. But for whatever reason, we've accepted the fact that a certain amount of people are going to perish on our public roads. Now, the good news here is that according to research conducted by NHTSA, 19 out of 20 of those accidents can actually be prevented with autonomous vehicles thus potentially saving upwards of 1.1 million lives per year. And so that is just one of the many reasons that I think this is a very, very important thing to be discussing, not just in this room, but obviously within state and federal government as well. So with that as the uh, backdrop, let me dive into some questions for our panelists. First question. Do you think autonomous vehicle regulations are necessary at this stage in the technology's development, and why or why not? And I'll open it up to the panel. Elliot, I'll, I'll start the conversation off there. I, I think they're, they are necessary for a variety of reasons. One, uh, something that we really do see among the member companies of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, and just by way of context, we have over 400 member companies uh, that we represent on issues. One of the things that we really do see is actually an appetite for regulations. Now, that doesn't mean over-regulations, but really it's smart regulations. And by smart regulations, it goes to issues specifically about the safety. That's the biggest concern that everyone has. And the reason why there is so much emphasis being put on smart regulations for safety, one, there's the inherent value of having the safety, but two, there's also a sense that there's a public narrative being written right now about autonomous vehicles. And so many people around the country are skeptical. Now we here who work in the industry or we're in Silicon Valley or other tech hubs around the country, we're very comfortable with this idea. We're very open to this. But for many people who don't live this every day, there are some very real concerns. 
So getting the safety right is essential. And without the proper level of regulations, what we're going to see is many actors moving into this field who are not doing things the right way. And when that happens, and when there are accidents or when there are problems, that only strengthens the critics and the skeptics who really view autonomous vehicles through a different lens and are much less willing to accept it. So I, I think regulations are very much necessary. I, I, I agree with Peter, and I know that's probably strange coming from someone who works for a free market think tank. I should say that the R Street Institute, our motto is free markets, real solutions. And while, while that means that we want to see as little regulation as is possible, uh, regulations serve a role. They make the market regular, and that is ultimately what is necessary if you're going to have a functioning market. So the question really turns on what level is the regulation taking place at, what is the regulation attempting to accomplish, and, and at what point is it coming into effect? Because the last thing that we want to see is regulation getting out too far ahead of where the technology is. Um, I, I guess I want to just step back for a second and talk about what we're talking about when we talk about autonomous vehicles. Um, because I think it's really important to the question of, are we ready to regulate or not? Um, so at Ford, we've announced that we're working on an SAE level four vehicle um, for use in a commercial application like ride hailing or ride sharing or package delivery um, that will have limitations. Uh, it might be within a geofenced area, it might you know, only go on certain road types. There's, there's all sorts of things that uh, go into that, what makes a level four. And if you don't know the SAE levels and you want to have an intelligent conversation about autonomous vehicles, I would encourage you to go look at them so you can understand. Um, because we do have a narrative that's being built around autonomous vehicles that also includes discussion about things like Tesla Autopilot, which is level two on the automation scale and is vastly different from the level four vehicle that Ford is planning that isn't going to have a steering wheel, isn't going to have a brake pedal, won't have an accelerator pedal, and doesn't need the operator to do anything within those limitations. That is also vastly different from a level five vehicle, which is you pick the destination wherever, whenever, under any conditions, and you can go there. And maybe you have personal ownership of that vehicle as opposed to it being part of uh, a service that you use or, or something like that. So, the, the, the narrative is being built, and it's causing people to have reaction in the regulatory space, but it's very, very hard to regulate when you literally don't have a, a production-type vehicle that you could evaluate. How would we regulate the safety of a level four vehicle without controls today? I don't think we're ready to do that quite yet. So we were very appreciative of the approach that NHTSA has taken, which is rather than jump into regulation, which can be a really long and cumbersome process, but let's start the conversation with guidance and talk about the things that are going to be important in the long term. And so we, we've been very supportive of that as an approach. Because I think today, if we sat down and said, what are, the, what are the tests or what are the metrics we're going to use to assess the performance of a level four vehicle, we're, we're not ready. We're not there yet. You know, and building on that, you know, um, this, this idea of smart regulation and safety, Allstate was a very, a, the, one of the major leaders for safety belts, for airbags, and there are some things the free market just won't do on its own. But once reg smart regulations come in, it will make things more safety, and those have saved lives. And a classic example of autonomous vehicles now is some people want to test autonomous vehicles without, that don't have steering wheels, that don't have brakes, without a human operator on public roads. And you think about that for a second, with no capacity for a human in the car to intervene. And you think about that, it's a test. If it's a test, that means they don't know if it works. Because if it did, it wouldn't be a test. It would be done. So we're thinking, why not during the test, eventually everyone knows there will be cars with no steering wheels, no brakes, no pedals. But in the test phase, why not have a, we believe there should be a human in the car to override it so if something goes wrong, it could be safe. You know, it's classic safety. And again, you know, smart regulation wanted to kill the thing. If someone gets killed by an autonomous vehicle in the test phase without a human being in it, that's going to really set things back a long time. You put the human in, there are two possibilities. The human's not needed, it passes the test, we're home free. 
the human intervened, then thank goodness no one was killed, and testing proceeds on a more rational basis. That's a classic example of where smart regulation, and we're all, it's all about saving lives, where smart regulation can come in and actually make it easier for the free enterprise system to flourish. So a couple things. Um, Peter, you were saying essentially if we don't have the regulations, then potentially bad actors will do bad things. Uh, I'm paraphrasing. Um, <laughs> but so the, I actually do think that we need regulations um, for a slightly different reason. I actually think that most all of the clients that I work with, um, especially traditional automakers, they think about safety 99.5% of the day, maybe even higher. I'll ask them questions that are unrelated to safety and they'll answer with a safety answer. Um, so in, in the tort law system is in place that will incentivize these companies. I mean, if you come out with a fully self-driving car and a crafty plaintiff's attorney can make the argument that there is a reasonable alternative design that has a car with zero connectivity, that's a billion dollar lawsuit. Right? So I think that there's drivers that are incentivizing these companies regardless. The reason that I believe that we do need regulations is because that 1.2 million number. There's a disconnect between 1.2 million people dying, a clear path to a technology that can cut that number down drastically, yet the driving public hasn't bought into that idea. And I think if we don't have regulations and it's just the wild, wild west, they will continue to not buy into that idea. So I think part of it is that we need regulations so that the driving public feels safe that they're coming into something that is a regulated space. And then one thing that Emily mentioned, which I agree with, she mentioned the level two vehicle uh, that crashed and ended up uh, killing the person who was in the driver's seat. And I, probably like most of you on the panel, was kind of pulling my hair out the next day because even big media outlets, essentially the headline was self-driving car kills person, which couldn't be further from the truth. It's, it's nowhere near a self-driving car. It's a level two vehicle that was being operated by the human as though it was a self-driving vehicle. But the fact of the matter is, if it was a level five vehicle with V to V, that accident doesn't probably doesn't come within a thousand yards of taking place. So it was a it was a frustrating uh, happenstance. But anyways, let's jump into the next question. Well, can I just pause for a second? Sure. Um, I, I had this exact conversation with somebody last night, uh, having spent the last twenty years working in one of the most heavily regulated uh, consumer product areas that you could work in. I don't think it's the wild wild west. Um, NHTSA has massive, massive enforcement authority. It's not all about did you meet the FMVSS or not. The criteria is, is there an unreasonable risk to motor vehicle safety? That's illegal to put that out into the market. If it's already in the market, you have an obligation to recall those vehicles. That's on every manufacturer. So I, I take issue when people say if we don't have any regulations, we don't have any control over what people are doing because NHTSA has that authority, and they flex their muscles in that regard every day of the week. Sure, and I, I couldn't agree more. Obviously, we're, we work on these issues every day. We're in the space, so we're cognizant of what's actually taking place. But to the general public, I think they need to see states or federal actors you know, stepping in to have that level of comfort. So I don't, I don't know that I agree with you, Elliot. I know, um, you know when, when President Obama author, authored his op-ed in the Pittsburgh paper right before uh, Uber launched its testing program there, he said that it was going to be necessary to build consumer confidence to have safety regulations, to have sensible regulations. Of course, there are all kinds of regulations already in place. Um, but I would also say, Consumers having not had any experience with this technology, well, here's an example. When folks were asked, do you want an iPad, and then the iPad was described to them, people did not want an iPad. They did not understand the role that it would play in their lives. And I understand vehicles are different, but I'm just, every time there's a study that comes out that suggests that the, the public is very concerned about autonomous vehicles and will not adopt the technology, I, I just think to myself, well, it's really hard to know until you've had experience with the technology. Anyone else want to weigh in? Okay. Second question, what do you believe is the appropriate balance between state and federal regulation? So, I, I, I mean, 
I probably don't have an answer to that exact question, but you know, when we have the conversation about do we need regulation now, one of the things that we have to take into account is the fact that we have states struggling in a space that's traditionally been something that's been regulated at the federal level, which is vehicle performance in terms of safety. So we have, you know, we have this classic relationship. Um, the federal government regulates vehicle performance and vehicle safety through FMVSSs and the Safety Act. States typically regulate safety of drivers. They do licensing, they do insurance, they do things like that. Um, now we're in a situation where we're talking about the driver will be the vehicle. You're gonna have a virtual driver. So there's understandably confusion about who's gonna regulate the driver when the driver is a virtual driver and states are clearly struggling with this. And this is one of those opportunities where um, we really like what NHTSA did and we really are waiting for what's that next step going to be because NHTSA is going to have to flex their muscles in this space a little bit for states to have some confidence that they don't have to regulate virtual drivers, that they can leave that to the federal government and that regulatory regime um, because what we can't have is the patchwork of requirements where uh, California has one set of performance-based rules. Indiana has a different set. Texas has a different set. There's a set of tests or metrics or things that you have to perform that makes it impossible for a manufacturer to design a product that can comply with all 50 states' rules. And I'll build on, on, on Emily's point there for just one second. I mean, I, I thought the, the NHTSA uh, guidelines with the, the flexibility and almost the, the voluntary nature of those as serving as kind of an example for states is good in the sense that it does provide that leadership for states to look to. And one of the things that, that I've seen in working with our own state legislature here in California is that the legislature is, is very good at legislating. And that's good sometimes and that's bad sometimes. And certainly no disrespect intended to them, but these are very complex, very technical issues. And for legislators who don't have the background to kind of wade into that territory and to start legislating in that space, um, or our own state, uh, state agencies in, in a regulation sense, um, that can be very tricky and cause a lot of unintended problems. Um, so I think I like the fact that, again, the NHTSA guidelines do serve as an example. They do give the confidence to the states, and they provide a means kind of going forward. It's a nice starting point in that space. So the leadership that the guidelines undoubtedly provide, and I, I do like the voluntary nature of them, particularly given that if we are, I mean, as you say, if we are to have prescriptive regulation at this point, it's not, it's not going to address exactly what we need. But at the same time, the guidance has to be on point, and it shouldn't be having unintended consequences. So for instance, right, uh, the guidance is voluntary, and yet California and its proposed regulations currently requires companies to certify their compliance with these voluntary guidelines that were not drafted or promulgated in a way that we would be comfortable with um, having them become mandatory. So you're stuck in sort of this interesting situation. I don't know how developers and OEMs plan to, plan to comply with that, um, just because we're giving a lot of power over to these regulatory bodies in terms of their judgment of what compliance actually entails. Yeah, um, you know, I totally agree with you. You can go look at Ford's comments <laughs> with regard to earlier drafts of the California rules, and this was one, one point that we took up in particular. Because we haven't been through a rulemaking process with NHTSA, we don't, you know, we don't have that certainty, and we don't, we haven't had the opportunity to object. And frankly, the guidelines themselves are, you know, when you think about setting up a compliance program for the guidelines, I'm not sure what you would do because they're they're not very specific. Right. And so, I, I totally agree with you that the, the the converting a voluntary process into a mandatory one kind of takes away the point of having the voluntary process to start with. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think another thing is, I think everyone, um, as you guys have said, embraced the fact that um, it's good that this was nimble regulation, that they're going to revisit it, that they're going to listen to stakeholders' views and update the document. It's kind of going to be a living, breathing document. But at the same time, Emily, you hit on the fact that traditionally the feds regulate the car and states regulate the driver, but now there's this gray area because the driver is the car. Right, And so, at least in, in my view, in a perfect world, because by releasing the guidance, they're not preempting any state law. 
right? So in a perfect world, you would have Congress come in, uh, enact AV legislation that preempts state law, and then that would eliminate this patchwork. Whether or not that will actually happen, we've seen some <laughs> thoughts around that idea, but we'll have to see in the coming months and years. It's definitely going to be one of the interesting issues that's going to develop and, and something that's not without controversy. There's a lot of stakeholders in the process and a lot of different perspectives on that. Okay, question three. Do you believe our judicial system is well equipped to handle autonomous vehicle liability issues? All right, I guess I'll be the brave one. <laughs> Um, I, I guess, uh, let, let's start with, you know, what are we talking about when we talk about liability? That question comes up all the time, and I always say, well, what do you mean? Because when you talk to OEM manufacturers, they think you mean product liability. When you talk to insurers, they think you're talking about auto neg and how we're going to sort out routine day-to-day -day auto accidents that are managed by insurance companies. When you talk to state regulators, they think you're talking about who's going to be responsible when there's a, a, a speeding ticket issued to a vehicle, who's liable for that ticket, who's responsible for that breaking of the law. And those are all vastly different questions. Um, I would argue that, that the, the last example I talked about, who gets the speeding ticket and who's going to be responsible for it, is the one we're least equipped to deal with right now. Um, how do you issue a speeding ticket to a virtual driver? Does it go to the manufacturer? What are the practical elements of that? If you're a manufacturer and you get a speeding ticket, you know, do you, is there a due process concern that you weren't there, you didn't get the ticket? How do you contest that? I, mean, I think our regulatory structure in most states is not set up to deal with this problem, which seems very simplistic, but I think is actually very complicated. Um, on the other end of it, um, in terms of product liability, I think um, at some point in the future when we get to this uh, idea where you have all vehicles without human drivers and everything's controlled by vehicle, you know, is, is the vehicle and there's no humans involved in the process whatsoever, I think the questions about product liability are going to become really, really important. In the near term, we're going to have this mix of human-driven vehicles and automated vehicles of varying levels of automation. And so to, to say we're going to craft some solution or we need to change our, our legal framework for analyzing these, I, I just don't see it, you know, that we're ready to do that yet. And I'm not sure it's necessary. And part of the problem also is the, you know, the way things are set up, um, you, know, you ask how, if the judicial system is ready. The judicial system has to interpret the statutes. And the problem is the statutes are antiquated in many cases regarding liability because the statutes were drafted before these innovations occurred. And it's kind of ironic, you know, the insur for the insur everything, no matter how you look at it, the same liabilities are going to exist. I mean, someone's got to, the car has to be insured by someone. The human has to be insured by someone. It's going to shift to a certain extent because as the car is more, to more product liability away from human liability, if the cars are more and more autonomous. But the problem is that, the, for example, insurance regulations are very, very old. And insurance companies are going to need to innovate to cover these new products. And it's kind of ironic that most of the innovation is coming out of California, which you'd expect it to come out of. And yet California has one of the worst regulatory systems for insurance companies. I mean, under your Prop, 10, you know, Prop 103 was passed before none of this existed. Does anyone here even know what Prop 103 is? I mean, some of you are young. You've probably lived, it's been here your whole life, probably. But under Prop 103, insurance companies are extremely limited as to what they can rate on and how they can charge rates and the factors they can, can consider and not consider. And there are many benefits that people in other states get that people in California cannot get because Prop 103 will accent forgiveness, all sorts of, you know, by giving you a, a better insurance rate because of your credit history, all sorts of wonderful things that we can do in other states we can't do in California because we're locked in. And, if, and in order to innovate, you know, there's an old saying that insurance is the oxygen of the free enterprise system. No one is going to take risks if they don't have insurance. Would you buy a house if you didn't have homeowner's insurance? Even if insurance wasn't mandatory, would you drive a car if you couldn't get liability insurance? Yet we're not going to be able to quickly as adapt as quickly as we need to unless these insurance regulations are changed. 
and repealed in some cases to allow insurance companies to innovate to the same extent as you are all innovating. And that, I think, is a really key point that we've got to make. We've got to be able to insure these things. We have to find creative ways to do it, but we're locked in by these archaic regulations, especially in California. Well, and, and I mean, building on that, I think, I think the situation is actually really quite dire because mm -hmm. Prop 103 passed in 1988 to use, you know, by Consumer Watchdog, their name has already come up once today, um, to, to overturn Prop 103, you, you need a vote of the people. It will have to go back to the people. So these are the obstacles that we're not thinking about because they're not right in front of us that could really slow the deployment of some of these new technologies. And it's really, it's really ridiculous because under the current system, under Prop 103, there are actually mandatory rating factors that have to be taken into account in a specific order and weighted in a specific way for, for rates to be promulgated. And so that includes um, your driver safety record, how many miles you've driven, and things that have very little to do with how these new sorts of vehicles are going well, to operate. Well, the classic is driving experience. Yeah. You, right now, we're required to rate on driving experience, no matter how little sense it makes. Now, it makes a lot of sense now, right? The more your driving experience is related to how you drive. If you're in a fully autonomous vehicle without a steering wheel and brakes, why in the world would we care right, about how, what your driving experience We'd be required to do that. It makes no sense. And it's just getting more and more of that point. As time goes on, even as we get to fully autonomous, the more the, car, the, car, the characteristics of the car are going to become more important than the characteristics of the driver as we move on. Yet we can't innovate like that. And we want to, and we need to. And what's going to wind up happening is people in California will pay more for insurance than they need to pay. And they'll pay irrational rates than they need to pay. And it just doesn't make sense. It's true in every state. I mean, all the states have antiquated regulations. Although Illinois actually is very good. It's almost free market in Illinois. But in most states, there's problems. But California in particular, and it's just I can't get over the irony. I mean, it's Silicon Valley. Why are you letting this happen? Why do I have to come to Chicago to tell you this? I mean, it shouldn't be happening, right? <laughs> you guys should know. I mean, you're innovators. You're smart. Change your system and let us innovate and let us help you. And let, let's give you lower rates. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, let, let me ask a more specific question. So some OEMs have come out and said, if they have a fully autonomous vehicle that's driving in fully autonomous mode, and that vehicle crashes, they will be on the hook in terms of liability. Now, let me ask kind of a law school exam question hypothetical. Wow. What, what if, and I'll make it short, <laughs> what if that vehicle, so all the vehicles are going to get over the air updates to fix issues in the vehicle, right? And so let's say that the OEM sends an over the air update and all the owner of the vehicle has to do is press accept, and he or she does not press accept. And then the vehicle ends up crashing as a result of the fact that they didn't press accept to that over-the-air update. Who would be liable? Well, it would take a pretty heartless auto manufacturer to deny liability just because they forgot to press accept, right? You would never do that, would you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, Ford cares, right? Have you driven a Ford lately? <laughs> would you do that? <laughs> Um, I'm curious. As to any liability situation, I think you have to, there's so many factors that you have to look at. You got to look at, somebody says to me, an autonomous vehicle in autonomous mode gets in an accident, who's at fault? There's so many questions I want to know the answer to, right? Um, you, can't, you can't do these things in a vacuum. Even those manufacturers who've made some of those statements, um, when you really look at what they've said or what they say, you know, after the fact or when you talk to them, what they're really saying is if the vehicle's in autonomous mode and it's the vehicle's fault, we'll be responsible, which is common sense, right? That's what any manufacturer would say. If we're at fault, then we're, we're responsible for it. Well, that's the law as it exists today. Exactly. Right. So um, I think we just have to be careful about, you know, putting too much obligation on anyone in any fact pattern without having all of the questions answered. So I'm not going to answer your question because there's a question. lot of other things I'd like to know. It's a question. <laughs> but maybe that goes to just a, a quite simple negligence uh, analysis of the situation, which is what would a reasonable person do in similar cir circumstances? You get the updates that come in. It has updates every so often, and you simply have to press accept. What would a normal person do in those kind of circumstances? Maybe it becomes that easy 
a question. And that was the answer I was fishing for. So, it, so in other words, Good I job. believe, and I think I, from what I've heard up here today that most of you believe that our current legal system is pretty well set up to, to tackle these issues. I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, mm -hmm. but I think that's... Well, there's a lack of certainty in today's legal system. I mean, you're right. Ultimately, it is set up. I mean, it's going to evolve, but there's a lack of certainty right now, which is a bit of a problem as well, and it's going to get ironed out. And the other thing I just want to make sure we touch on which kind of relates in all seriousness to the accept thing is there's also the risk of hackers. I mean, one of the things that, are you ready to ask that? That's my next question. Okay, well then let's go. Um, I mean, we've mentioned that in our comments to NHTSA that um, with hacking, I mean, you talk, you know, autonomous vehicles will be safe if they're, operate, if they're operated properly, but hackers, you know, we, there have been tests done right now where people have hacked into cars, even on today's roads, literally cars driving today can be hacked into because when you think of, you have your iPhone or your Mac or whatever you use, those are very safe because they're made to be safe. But many people, when you talk about the Internet of Things, you know, talk to who's that um, Trump person who thought that Obama could steer through the microwave. I mean, it hasn't gotten to that point yet, but these various devices are not as secure as iPhones and computers. They can be hacked into, and inside your car, there are all sorts of things that aren't designed by Apple and Microsoft necessarily, but they can be hacked into more easily. And all it takes is one vulnerability, and we've seen, you know, we've had, we've seen experiments where people have hacked into cars, driven them off ditches, and there's an article just last week where someone was talking about the CIA has actually um, looked into it because that is almost a perfect form, way to assassinate someone to break into a car. And as they become more and more autonomous, hacking becomes a bigger and bigger risk, both systemically and individually. And that is something we've really got to have very, very strong cybersecurity standards if we're going to do this because that could be equivalent to a huge catastrophe. So that's a perfect segue. Um, Question four, many believe that autonomous vehicles present a rich attack surface for cyber attacks, I would say Stephen mm -hmm. included. Where do you believe liability will rest in the event an autonomous vehicle is hacked? I think in that, in that circumstance that we were talking about, um, again, just to get to your, to your earlier point, you're right, as more and more devices kind of come online, whether they're uh, you know, phones, refrigerators, homes, cars, whatnot, that attack surface increases and there are more areas of access for the malicious actors. Um, so building that in, how do you build defense in by design? It's not simply building a car and then after the fact saying, wait a second, we forgot about the security component, let's go back and graft something onto that. But how do we actually bake that in along the process? Uh, I, I think that defense by design certainly has to be a part of the, uh, of the process. The challenge with trying to regulate that is you're trying to hit a moving target because the attacks and the nature of the attacks are constantly evolving. So mandating a specific requirement, you must be certified or self-certified that you are able to defend against this type of, uh, of attack, whatever that might be, uh, that's simply just not realistic. It'll be outdated by the time it, uh, by the time it comes off the fleet. Um, that's going to be challenging. So I, I don't have an answer as to what that looks like, but I would caution regulators against trying to simply present a laundry list of things that have to be checked off in terms of security. Yeah, just real quick following up on that point, I was recently speaking with a security researcher who made the analogy to drug testing in the Olympics for cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. He said, the people who take steroids are always one step ahead mm -hmm. of the testers because what the testers do is they say, oh, here's this new drug, we should create a test around it. And it's the same with cybersecurity is the way that he looked at things. Yeah, it's exactly the zero day exploit. It's mm -hmm. an exploit that hasn't yet been known and, and so how do you defend against something that you don't even know exists? Sure. Sorry, Emily. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more with um, you know, both of those statements. I think to talk about the, you know, the liability aspect for a second, as a defense lawyer for the last 15 years, my initial reaction is, oh, now we're responsible for the malicious criminal behavior of third parties who try to break into our vehicles. If someone walks by your car and puts a rock through your window and steals your wallet or steals your car or does whatever, is that on Ford Motor Company to be responsible for that? But I do think cybersecurity is different. Um, it's a different environment. People have different expectations, and I think it goes back to the question of reasonableness. Um, you know, OEMs can't do, and they can't do nothing, right? We have to think about the cyber problem, not just from protecting ourselves legally, but it's just the right thing to do for our customers. Um, but you know, 
the moving target of what is going to be good enough and what's going to be judged by any particular jury um, to, to be good enough is, is a really interesting question. And we don't have a lot of case law or examples to look at right now to, to help guide us in that space. But I do think most auto manufacturers are taking a responsible approach. We're doing things like joining the auto ISAC so we can share information about threats and proactively looking at what are the best practices and things that we can do to help you know, secure our vehicles. Because it's that, important for our customers. And that area, that's one area where actually the enterprise system will work a, to a, a better extent because in today's world, you know, people buy software to protect, their, to protect their computers, for example. And I'm sure that consumers will look into just how cars are manufactured and take into account the risk of cybersecurity. I mean, different people, just like in today's world, you can buy different types of computers at different levels of security. And that can be, and, I'm sure, and probably, and I can't say for certain because it hasn't happened yet, but insurance companies, you know, in today's world, we do rate where we can, where we're allowed to, on the safety of the vehicle itself. You have anti-lock brakes, you might get a discount in some states. If you have, you know, certain other safety standards in your car and a high level of cybersecurity, it, it's conceivable some insurance companies might decide, you know what, maybe you get a discount if you have certain levels of cybersecurity in your car. Because if you don't, that is, it is a greater risk. I, it's a little problematic, though, because one of the problems with cybersecurity, as opposed to talking about you know problems with an airbag system or mm -hmm. um, you know something mechanical, when you talk about what the vulnerabilities are and problems with cybersecurity, you are instantly creating sort of the roadmap for the, the bad actors to know this is the this is the place where I should go. So mm -hmm. you know when we go through the process of saying this is more secure than this. We kind of put a target on the less secure systems, and there's a, there's a risk in that. Good point. Yeah, I mean, I, I liked your point, too, about going after an OEM when the car gets hacked. It's a little, uh, assuming that the OEM acted reasonably, it's a little bit akin to going after a bank instead of the bank robber, right? <laughs> um, but I think that I asked a bad question, quite frankly. I think, because I said, where do you believe liability will rest? I think in real terms, a uh, portion of my practice is litigation, and in real terms, that person is going to go after the entity or entities that have the deepest pockets. In nine times out of 10, maybe 10 times out of 10, that's going to include the OEM, I would think. Um, but anyways, we only have a couple minutes left. I can ask another question, or I can uh, open it up to the audience for questions, wh whatever you guys prefer. Audience. Comment, and then a question. The comment, when you mentioned the, the person pushing the stop or accept button, what about foreseeable misuse? You know, sometimes uh, the third restatement says that um, foreseeable misuse by a person using the product doesn't get the defendant off the hook. I don't know. Maybe it's the question, but that's what I would have said. <laughs> Um, the question I have is, with regard to the judiciary and their uh, sophistication level, do you see maybe an increase in the use of special masters for uh, litigation around uh, driverless cars or autonomous vehicles? So I haven't thought about that question in particular. Maybe. I mean, one of the things we have to uh, accept is with increasing levels of automation in vehicles, whether you're partially automated or you're talking about a level four or five vehicle that's fully automated, the, the classic product liability issues that we've dealt with in the past are more mechanical and things that you can have an expert come in and testify about fairly easily. In the software context, um, we don't have a lot of expertise in our legal system in dealing with those types of cases in a product liability setting. So I do think um, the courts are going to be taxed at some level to handle those complicated software issues. So I guess my question is whether or not the hacking incident is something that is viewed as an insurable, rateable risk. Um, because uh, as I'm looking forward at this, you could have a case where hacking, you know, uh, multiple death scenario, but the manufacturers found to have met their standard of care because they were doing as best as possible. And if um, the insurance companies don't feel that they could, they could rate it properly because how do you do that, you could end up with a situation where um, who then pays for the damages. And I don't think our regulators or policymakers are going to let a situation occur where somebody isn't uh, uh, paying for 
for that response. So, you know, that's a good, that's a great question. There, the, short, the short answer is there is no answer. The longer answer is you know, a good analogy to that. There's some things are uninsurable, and some things people do and bear the risk. It shouldn't, like a classic example is flood. Typically, things that are uninsurable are things that happen all at once to everyone in the same place. So for example, on one end of the spectrum, auto accidents are insurable because one car might crash, but it'll be one out of 100. And if one car crashes, they're not all going to crash. Uh, at the other extreme is an earthquake or a flood. I mean, if that happens, it happens to everyone at once. There's no pooling of the risk because the whole risk has gone at once. And typically, insurance companies either exclude those and they don't pay for them, and that's the way it is, and that could be true of hacking. Or if we're allowed to charge the price we need to charge, I mean, in theory, everything can be insured if we're allowed to charge the price it truly costs to insure it. But in the real world, the cost of some things are just too much. And we see this in flood insurance right now. I mean, the flood insurance program is $24 billion in debt. And bigger waters passed, and to put it on the path of fiscal solvencies, Congress knew full well what it was doing when it passed it. But then homeowners in certain areas, like Louisiana, began ex complaining when they got massive rate increases. Well, if you want to be fiscally solvent, you're going to have to see rate increases. And Congress then repealed the key parts of it, and now it's still insolvent. So with hacking, we just don't know how prevalent it's going to be. It might be uninsurable. It might not be. Um, again, it's going to, a lot of it's going to depend on product liability. Was the, assuming the manufacturer was reasonable, and I don't think anyone would suggest that a manufacturer could be expected to stop every conceivable type of hacking. It could still be insurable if it happens every now and then, but on the other attempt, you have a terrorist attack, for example, where someone decides you're going to wipe out the entire system and shut down every car in a whole area. That might not be insurable. It's a great question. That might be an example where the government might have to come in, because typically the government comes in where the, when the private mar market can't function, and this might be a situation like that. But no one really knows yet, but it's, it's something we've got to think about, and it's a great question. I think it's necessary to embrace regulatory flexibility at the state level, particularly with departments of insurance, just so that we can start to examine these sorts of things. Because if, if the department is not going to approve that as potentially even a rating factor, then it's a, it's a moot question, and you might have some incentives get misaligned. Hey there. I want to go back to a comment that Mr. Sheffy made about testing versus deployment. Uh, and we touched already on how this sort of blurs the line between what the driver is and what the vehicle is. And so when you're talking about licensing uh, and preparing a vehicle for the road, that blurs the line between state and federal responsibility. Uh, there's a similar blurred line between testing and deployment, especially when systems are on a fleet-based system and are learning uh, constantly. And those updates will be happening frequently. They may be happening over the air without needing to be accepted by an end user, especially if it's a managed fleet. Is our regulatory system and our, our judicial systems prepared for that type of deployment? You know, it's going to are they ready? The judicial system almost by definition is ready for anything. They'll just take what the law is, and if there's a law, no law, they'll make it up. Uh, do we have a good system? And that's an example of a federal standard, possibly. Um, the updates will have to come, but it's going to really depend on what the states have. And today, if there is no regulation, we're ready for it. The question is whether it's a good idea or not. And it's, it's a, again, that's a classic example of a question I don't think has been answered yet. And it's got to be answered. But if you want a quick answer, the judicial system is definitely ready. If there's no regulation, it, it can happen. I mean, anyone disagree? Yeah, I think it's a good question. Questions from anyone else? Okay, thank you very much.